Hi, I'm Randall, co-host of The Drumming Show. We're pleased to bring you episode one in four short chapters. Our guests are Scott Paulson and Barb Smith, professional steel drum players and educators from the Vermont Independent School of the Arts. Our host, Bob Sparadale, learns how their family backgrounds influenced their early musical development. Then moving on from there, how can traditional drummers integrate with steel pan playing? By the way, if you want to watch the entire show in one piece as it was originally recorded, please visit us at cnow.tv. That's C-N-O-W TV. Now let's get started with Chapter 2, Scott Paulson and Barb Smith. And the other side of that is from the audience side. You know, that we think of it from the musician's point, but the audience is the other half. Without the audience, there's no reason for us. You never know what kind of day, and we've discussed this, that people are having out there and how volatile it could be and how blessed we are to have the gifts we have to present the creative output and who's to say if somebody in a situation that isn't so good couldn't be inspired by that not only to I don't want to say turn their life around but just to make them think that there is more hope than maybe I thought a few minutes ago Absolutely. You know, so it, it's a very noble thing. And for that, we pay dearly, don't we? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> I mean, one thing I wanted to add to what you were saying is in, for young people coming up, you know, you see these people who are really strong in music or the arts, and they're just going for it, and it's easy to get discouraged, you know, if you're not at the top of that kind of heap in your school or whatever. But I'm here to tell you, I was a late bloomer. I was not the best percussionist in my school. I was very shy. Um, my band director was very stern, you know, and uh, so if you had asked me when I was a high school junior if I thought I would go into music, I would probably have said no. And as I mentioned before, I tried not to go <laughs> into music. My, my degree was first an associate's degree in music merchandising, so I was thinking that I was going to like do music, but all right, well, I, but I'm probably not good enough to really make it as a musician, so I'll do the business end of it. Um, and then I went out to the repair school, learned how to fix instruments, eventually finished up my degree at Johnson State in like just a general music kind of course work. Um, but I really feel like I'm a late bloomer. You know, I'm playing with some wonderful artists now in a number of different organizations on different instruments, and music is really my life, but it was... I came through, I think, the back door in terms of that. It became obvious to me that this is the only thing that really made me feel awesome. But, that just, yeah. as Barb said, it just fed me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I worked in, like I said, repairing instruments and whatnot, and that was good. It was good work. They were nice people to work for, but it didn't feed me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I came to a realization, like one of those aha moments where I'm fixing people's instruments to enable them to make music. And I just said, something isn't right about this. <laughs> you know, because I, I know I have it in me, mm. you know, but here I am enabling other people to do it as, instead of enabling myself to do it. Mm. So, and that's when I started to kind of move away from that. And teaching feeds me too yes. in a different way. And it also improves, as you well know, your own musicianship by, by mm. showing others how to do it. And, but it also, this whole thing gives me a lot more understanding for kids who might have an awful lot of talent, and Barb and I both have students like this, yes. but they're just not quite, you know, driven yet to it. That can change. Your but point. that can change. Yeah. Yes. And you make two very valid points, being mentioning the late bloomer thing. I happen to have been in music retail for the past 35 years, and we've seen grandmothers at 75 say, <laughs> I want to play drums. And isn't that wonderful? Because you get one life. Who's to say, no, you can't have fun. You can't be creative, you know? You might as well. Um, the other valid point is that you can come into it. it you don't have to start off great. It's just a, a consciousness. And hopefully the show will make that more apparent that if you focus on anything, you get better at it. And like we try to talk to students about that, that skill serves them in their entirety of their life. Whatever they go to do, they'll be better at it because they've learned to actually focus. 
Um, incidentally, the first um, professional gig I had when I moved up to Vermont from the Boston area was following Scotty into the drum chair <laughs> of, of a very popular, um, venerable band. Um, so he's an amazing player, and we always have discussions whenever Scotty's on the gig. It's just the groove is just smoking, and, and um, occasionally we all get to play together, and that is just so much fun. Um, so we will be bringing you some performance shortly. Uh, are there any questions that you think we should broach? Well, yeah, I think there, there are a number of questions. Uh, some of them that I have uh, relate to you know, the, the drums themselves, how they work, the mallets, the, mm -hmm. the technique. All those sorts of things. All you know, all those geeky kinds of things. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, not so much the uh, uh, some of the other issues, but um, that's going to be a fun thing. And um, what I was want, you know, you're talking about uh, teaching other people to play, and and I wonder, you know, what, how is it when you teach, and if this has happened to you, how, when you take a drummer, someone who plays, you know. Uh, conventional drums and and you know they they bump into what you're doing and they want to know about it how is it to teach somebody like that who's not used to reading notes you know everything is on one line for a lot of drummers or or a few lines but it's not any particular note and there's maybe not so much right and wrong but here you know it's like all those other instruments where you better get the right note at the right time how, how is it for that well um, our methodology for teaching steel drum is not so much to really teach them how to read notation and that this is an eighth note and that's a sixteenth. I mean, we try to impart some of that, but usually the goal is to, to get these people into the band and have them have fun. Um, and the rhythms that they're reading, this is, I mean, heavy duty, you know, soca, calypso, you know, uh, lots of offbeat rhythms that especially people in this area of the country where we live and the type of people that live around here are not used to these types of things. It's very complex to them. You know, their tendency is to want to put everything on the beat, you know, so instead of, you know, dun, 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 it's more like, uh, 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 you know, <laughs> and uh, it's very foreign to them. So to try to, to make it easier, like when we, we do use sheet music um, and we put it out there, typically we'll write, and to a point we shouldn't do it probably, but we, we write the note names above the notes in the music. The notes, when they start at least, are all written inside their instruments. And we'll talk about why that needs to be on a steel drum because it's not linear at all. Um, so they have those two aids and then I make um, CDs of their part, usually specifically so they can hear it by itself. They can practice it, I, I slow it down, they can practice it at increasing tempos, and then they hear how it fits with the rest of it all, and then we just kind of all blend it together. So that's that's the methodology in terms of the steel band anyway and how we operate that. Right. Well, I was wondering when, if, if somebody learns to play, you know, if, if a drummer, someone who plays drum set mm -hmm. uh, wants to bring, you know, they hear it, they hear the sounds that we're going to be hearing in a little while, and they want to bring that into their band, it, do you have some kind of advice you can give to them? How do they take those sounds and blend them into, you know, whatever style of music that they're doing? Well, of course, anyone who's been playing drum set for any length of time is going to have all the basic skills, which, which totally translate to steel pan. The um, single stroke rolls are, are, you know, essential and to have a nice blendable, you know, smooth, single stroke roll. We don't typically do double stroke rolls uh, on the pans and there isn't really need to because they ring so much that just if you're doing a you know a decent single stroke it just flies out there and is nice and smooth especially when you have several drums doing it. I mean if you're all doing three-legged horse rolls it still sounds nice out front because there's enough repetition going on to do that. So having the, the, the um, rudiment techniques excellent you know good wrist control all that and the rest is really, um, you know, there's a little bit of technique and how to hold the mallets so that the notes resonate well. And the rest is just finding the notes, which is probably the, actually the trickiest part of playing steel drums. It's just finding those infernal notes because they like to hide on you. You've got this much space, you wouldn't believe how those notes can hide. 
<laughs> and I'll, I'll explain more when we're actually looking at a drum and okay. what I'm talking about. All right. So well, that's great. It'll become clear. Yeah. I actually think as a horn player myself, when I play steel drums, it, you're, yes, you're a drummer, but it gives a, a drummer an opportunity to be more melodic. Mm -hmm. I mean, so in, in essence, when Scott's playing steel drums sitting in with a blues band or with any other band he's playing with, he's drumming, but he's almost acting like a horn player where he can yeah. solo as if a horn player would solo or he could strum as if a guitar player would strum. We actually, in steel drums, we strum chords. The and that's what they, they call it, strumming. They call it strumming. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into what the different pans are named because they're, they're quite interesting names, actually. Mm -hmm. But um, So it's, it's a way to drum but also be melodic. And, of course, drummers can also play melodically. Mr. Sparadale, you do that great, all. Yeah. All the great yes. jazz drummers advise thinking of melody. Yeah. And, and if you've noticed that uh, Scott and Barb disseminate information about music really easily and really just have a great flow to it, it's because they're consummate teachers. Maybe we can take a moment and talk about your school since you've been doing it and touched so many people. Well, thanks. Uh, started the school in, well, I started teaching in that space in 2001. Uh, we became a nonprofit in two? No. 2002. Is that right? Yeah. Um, much through the efforts of Barb, you know. Together. <laughs> you know, I had the initial vision of the school. I put that in a football and said, here, <laughs> <laughs> see you later. <laughs> no, no, we worked together, but she, she did a huge amount of work, and we had a good board, and the vision of the school, I had been teaching in public schools, um, and I was a little frustrated because I'd be in these smaller schools where they're like, well, we want to have a band, and here's the fourth grade. There's 25 of them. They play five different instruments, and you can have them for an hour a week. So we're looking forward to the Christmas <laughs> concert, the holiday concert. And that was hard, you know, and it would be nice to have a space where the people who were there were really focused, you know, and at least able to spend more time, get a little deeper into it, and... So you're not trying to teach dissimilar instruments in a small amount of time every week. So that gave me the initial thought about an art center where, you know, music lessons would be part of it, but also bringing in dance and, you know, whatever we, else we could pull in, fine art, sculpture. So we found this building. Uh, eventually, we purchased it, and we've been there for 10 years now. It's called the Vermont Independent School of the Arts. We're on Facebook. <laughs> And also one of our um, first uh, quotes that we like to use a lot in our promo was um, a place where you can rediscover your creativity. But this, this concept of rediscovering your creativity was something that we had thought of also because, you know, little kids are just spewing creativity <laughs> all the time, whether you want them to or not. <laughs> you know, they're imagining things and it's all coming out of them and they're the ones that are dancing at the show and all the adults are sitting there like, you know, they're not afraid because they're not inhibited. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, um, the being inhibited part gets learned. It's not, it's not innate. They learn to withhold, you know. So there's this, you know, I feel like by pursuing an artistic endeavor, you're pulling some of that youthful creativity out of yourself, rediscovering it. And that's what we wanted this center to be about. I hope you've enjoyed Chapter 2 of our four-part series. Please come back again next week as we continue our talk with Scott Paulson and Barb Smith on The Drumming Show. Remember, if you want to watch the entire show in one piece as it was originally recorded, please visit us at cnow.tv. That's C-N-O-W TV. If you're listening on the audio podcast and want to reach Scott Paulson and Barb Smith, their email address is V as in Vermont, I-S-A-V-T at AOL.com. That's V-I-S-A-V-T at AOL.com, or reach them by phone at area code 802-234-6987. That's 802-234-6987.